Hello and welcome back to the Talk 20s podcast. Today in the studio, we're joined by YouTuber and content creator, Maddie Borge. I cannot wait to have this chat with you because I feel like Maddie embodies everything that Talk 20s is all about. She's literally living her 20s online and she talks so much about how she manages her finances, how she's living in London, so many different things. And we're gonna cover it all in this episode because I feel like she's living a really fascinating life. And I'm just so excited to chat to her here in the studio today. So hello, Maddie, welcome to the podcast. Hi. Full transparency here, we love bringing you guys free weekly content, but in order to do this, we work with different brand partners who you'll hear from in this episode, including an advertisement from Zopa Bank. Hope you enjoy this week's episode. So excited to have you here. We have a little tradition that we always kickstart our podcast with where we ask our guests to look back at their phone from this time last year and show us a photo. So something that was going on in your life, tell us a little bit behind the scenes. It allows our listeners to get a picture of what your life is like. So. Can you show us your picture? <laughs> I can. So last year at this time, I was actually filming a video. Okay. <laughs> so I was surprised. She's yeah, a content surprise. creator through and through. <laughs> so I was popping around London and I was filming like a, my top three bakeries in London video. And that's so like, okay. all my photos are of What were your top three? I want to know. So Fortitude. Okay. This is like my, this is my top three last year. Yeah. I have like added some to the list, but it Do was like- Do you go like, to the bakery a lot? Like, Yeah, I yeah. love a good bakery. <laughs> I mean, I love coffee. I love yes, bakeries. Yeah, we were chatting about that. And I am yeah. Scandi and we yeah. pride ourselves on like good bread, good pastries. Mm -hmm, very so, true. So yeah, I think my favorite was Fortitude. And then we went to a scones bakery in Notting Hill, which is really fun. Like they only do scones. Oh. You can get like 10 types of scones. Lovely. And like add your own toppings. It's really fun. And then I think we also- Can I ask you a question? I, yeah. I don't know if this will change you. Like a, a normal like sc scone, scone, however you want to say yeah. it. You cut it in half. Yeah. You put cream, yeah. you put jam. Yeah. Do you do jam then cream or cream then jam? Like which order are you doing it in? Because that's a big jam, debate. Jam then cream. Jam then cream. Yeah. Wow, no, 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 <laughs> no, 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 no. It's cream then jam always. But people okay. are probably going to come at me in the yeah. comments go, it's not like that. But like, yeah. yeah. I, I got this comment. I was, uh, me and my boyfriend were sat like, we have like two like, old friends like I'm talking like 85 year olds that we met ah. in London they're like an old couple oh, they have cute. the cutest little house like yeah. in North London and we met them randomly at this restaurant and they keep inviting us out for like tea that's like really museums cute. like it's yeah. so cute and okay like it doesn't happen that often but like maybe once or twice or three times a year we go and like we meet them and we hang oh. out and we went to like um an afternoon tea with them and they had the same debate like me and Theo both did the same thing yeah. and my boyfriend did the same thing with like uh jam and then cream and they were like oh my god yes. <laughs> I don't know if it's a southern or a northern thing do you guys which one would you put like you two G and Sam what would you do jam first, jam first. yeah yeah I agree what do you do G on a scone Jump. I think it must be a northern and a southern thing maybe, then, maybe. because like I'm from like obviously down in Gloucestershire. I think down south and probably Londoners, they I might get this wrong as well, but I think they put cream first then jam. Got anyway, it. huge debate to kick off the podcast with, <laughs> and I'm sure it's what you listeners came for. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> so you're a content creator, yeah. and you've pretty much done this like your whole. I mean, you're 23 now. Yeah. yeah? Um, you've kind of done this your whole like working career because yeah. you started off very early doors yeah. on YouTube. Yeah. Tell me about. Maddie or Mace, Macely, yeah. how, how you started off back in, back in 2013, which yeah. is a long time ago yeah. to be in the content game. Yeah. Yeah. So I started on YouTube in 2013 because I saw all these like OG American YouTubers like mm -hmm. Bethany Mota, Stila Bebo Nine, like all the OG American girlies living in Los Angeles posting videos. And I was like, oh my God, that's so cool. And I think I was like, at that time I was looking for like a new hobby. Like as I was like in middle school, I wasn't doing that much in my free time. And I really liked like creating content like on my iPad. Mm -hmm. And I saw these girls and I was like, yeah, I could definitely do that. And it could be like a fun thing. Like I just wanted something to like do in my free time, like a hobby to have and like something just to do for fun. And I started making videos online, posting them with like no intention other than like, I want to have fun mm -hmm. and I want to recreate what these girls were doing because it looked so much fun. And so I was recreating their DIYs. I was recreating their, I don't know, like room makeover videos. Um, and it wasn't good, but I was having fun with it. And then I, I think I kept doing that for like a couple of months and I randomly had like a viral video and like viral for me when I was 13 was like 50,000 views, mm -hmm. which I mean in TikTok age, like that's probably not like that much. But for me back on, like back in the day on YouTube, that was like crazy. And I was like, whoa, like people are watching this. I'm getting followers, like this is crazy. Maybe I should just keep going. And so I kept it going, but I was never earning any money off of it. Like I was just doing it for fun and like as my little side, side gig. And 
then again, like I had the same thing, like one or two years later where I had another video go viral, but like viral, viral, like one, two million views. Mm -hmm. And it was like a study video, like come with me and study in school. But like, it wasn't actually a day in my life. Like I just went to school after school and like filmed it. It was really fun and super random that I went viral, but it did. And I was working as uh, <laughs> delivering newspapers at the time. Like I delivered newspapers yeah. on Sundays <laughs> to get some pocket money. And I didn't know I had like AdSense activated, but suddenly like I got this check from YouTube and I was like, what? Like I can earn money off of this? And it, it's like more than I earn delivering newspapers. Okay, maybe I can like take this a little bit more seriously, like make this like my little side income job. And so I basically was like, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna pursue this um, next uh, school, and I kept going at it like throughout middle school, throughout high school, and then when I w moved to London for uni, I just kept going at it as well and having fun with it and posting videos for my life. And my main priority was always studying and like going to high school and going to uni, but I was just having fun with it and like doing it in my in my free time. Like people have you know, part-time jobs. This was my part-time job that I had a lot of fun doing. It was also my hobby because I just always loved creating videos. And yeah, then I graduated and I decided maybe I could try to do this full-time and I did. And that's two years ago, right? And that's two yeah. years ago and I've been doing it full-time ever since. That's, so that's absolutely Turned my crazy. hobby into my job. <laughs> Which is a really nice thing. And I think yeah. there are many people out there who are listening who would love to turn their hobby yeah. or whatever they do into a job. I think, you know, when we're all younger, like, you know, a lot of people want to be, you know, professional footballers or sportsmen or whatever when they want to grow up or you know a lot of young people do aspire to want to do content creation full time yeah. so that's really cool I also think this was slightly different about your content as well is yeah you've done loads of like you know fun YouTube like you know trends and things like that but yeah. a, a lot of what you're posting right now is also you know or a day in the life and stuff but a lot of what you're posting right now is 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 quite educational you yeah. talk a, you talk quite a lot about how you're managing your finances yeah. you know how you're saving for your home and we're going to dive into a lot more of that in yeah. the podcast because that's exactly what we're we're all about mm -hmm. at talk 20s um but i think it's nice it's not it's not just you know you know i know you mentioned a you bakery video but there's so many yeah. more things that you talk about and you really open up about all aspects of your life which i think is lovely yeah I'm super proud that this podcast is brought to you in partnership with our headline sponsors, Zopa Bank, who are one of the UK's leading digital banks. Talk 20s would not be where we are today at all without their support. So a big, big thank you to them. But if you've not heard about Zopa before, you should definitely check them out. They're all about fair, simple, and easy to use financial products. My personal favorite is their Zopa Smart Saver, where you can create personalized pots for your different savings goals. To check them out for yourself, head to the app store and search Zopa, that's Z-O-P, PA and start saving from one pound. The interest is payable monthly and is subject to variation. Back to the show. You, you also, you grew up in Norway as yeah. well. So you moved over to London. Tell mm -hmm. us a little bit more about why you wanted to move to the UK. Okay. And you're staying, yeah. right? She's here to stay, guys. I'm here to stay. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I've always, I mean, it started with like my, my like obsession with like American YouTube girlies. Like I always envisioned or like imagined myself living abroad and having this like fun life when I was older and my parents studied abroad and so and I knew tons of people who were older who studied abroad and I saw these girls living abroad and I was like I want that life I want like to have my living abroad life and I loved growing up in Norway but like from as long as I can remember I always just wanted to go out there and like live my life a little bit abroad at least when I was young or like in my 20s and so I like that thought was in my head from a very early age and in high school when it was like about time to like actually apply to live abroad or like apply to go abroad um I initially wanted to do a gap year but my parents wouldn't allow me mm -hmm. and so then I was like very obsessed with the idea that like when I go to uni I want to be abroad and initially I was like I want to go to the US but then I don't know like the the later in my high school like the later or the older I became, the more I kind of realized that like, it's nice to be close to home. Mm -hmm. I do really like the UK. I've been to London like tons of times because I do have some family living here. And so it felt like almost like a second home for me in a way. And so I was like, okay, I think maybe I'll apply to live or like apply to go study in London instead. Cause it's already, it feels very familiar. If it, it feels closer to home, it's only like a two hour plane ride away from Norway. And so I applied to, to five unis in London and I ended up choosing King's College London as my like school that I wanted to go to. And then, yeah, so in 2019, I moved over and I started studying. 
Mm-hmm. I need a business management yes, as well. exactly, yeah. Did you pick that subject because you wanted to go into business or did you kind of like feel that you would always end up doing content creation? No, so co- like content creation, it's funny because like it was my hobby always, but mm-hmm. I never imagined myself working in it after uni. Like I started it as my hobby and I continued doing it for so long because it was my hobby. It was my like creative outlet. But in my head, like, I don't know why. I mean, I grew up like pre or not necessarily, but like, when I was younger, it wasn't a thing to like mm-hmm. become a content creator, like become a YouTuber. And it slowly became more and more normal. But still in my head, I was like, no, I'm going to go do a corporate job. I'm going to go work in a marketing agency or like work in a big corporate and like do something more like standard and not like as creative. And so I went to study and I did like economics and I did uh, management and I did marketing and I did like psychology like all these modules to like prepare me for life in a big corporate essentially so it was never my plan to like go full-time into content creation and what is like the, what do you think the major differences from living like obviously back in Norway yeah. and like the UK like what do you notice are the big major changes like it's just such a bigger country like mm-hmm. it, like not, Norway has five million people London has ten like that's crazy wow, yeah. like I in like the news outlets in Norway like it's crazy to me to think that like a Norway wide newspaper is like half as small as a London newspaper Mm -hmm. when like that is all that ever existed for me like growing up so it's just like it's a lot bigger in every single way you can imagine and obviously there's so many more opportunities there's so many more people like it's just bigger in every single way and that's kind of fun also to like live in and immerse yourself in when you're young I think. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But you did um, uni across COVID. You were one of the COVID generation for (laughs) university. Like, what was what was that like? Especially as obviously you were studying like in a different country, really. Yeah. So I was really lucky in that I got to start uni pre-COVID. So I started in 2019 and I got like a good, I don't know, like six, seven months without COVID. And then when COVID hit, I did really have or I felt like I had a really good network of friends and it's funny because I talk to my friends now and we're like we're still such a close-knit group the people I live with in first year like we're still like besties to this day we literally just came back from a group trip like a couple of days ago and we were talking about it when we were on the strip and we were like why why did we end up becoming so close from living together when a lot of other people who lived together in first year just kind of split up and like ended up like meeting new people and like becoming friends with them and like splitting their friend group up. And I think it's because of COVID because we had our friend group, then COVID hit and we were almost like forced to not meet anyone else and only stick together uh, because we only had each other, right? And like we almost became like a family away from family, Mm -hmm. all of us living in London and being students together and like we were our only support network. And yeah, like I'm happy I, I went to uni before COVID and then got to have my friend group and then got to stick with that friend group throughout those years because I don't know how it would have been if I started in COVID having to like find my friend group in the middle of the whole pandemic and you know quarantine and self-isolation situation that definitely must have been harder but yeah I mean going to uni in COVID wasn't great because obviously we missed out on a lot of the student experience I only had that in my first couple of months and then that was basically the end of it (laughs) but I'm very happy that like I got my friends and we stuck together and we're still like really, really great friends to this day. That is really good. I think a lot of people may not even have had that to be honest, yeah. like, cause three months at uni is not, you know, it's I didn't not, I didn't yeah. meet my closest friends at uni in my first three months. Like if that yeah. had happened for me, yeah. I would be like, you know, I don't know what, yeah. I, what would have happened, but yeah. it's, it's tough going and it's not like you can make friends through Zoom when you know, it's you're so sat difficult. there like, yeah. we're doing And all, like, it know? wasn't, it wasn't made easier either by like all the like self-isolation and like, yeah. you can't be closer than two meters to someone else because, oh my God, you might get like, well, COVID. Groups, groups of more than six. Do you yeah, remember when that crazy. was a thing? Yeah. Like, yeah. 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 Who's yeah. your group of six? Like I lived bubble? in dorms in my second year. I couldn't even have guests. Wow. Yeah. I couldn't have guests over because I was in group with that student accommodation even though we weren't even allowed to meet each other so like I can't imagine how that would have been if I didn't have anyone outside of it so yeah COVID Mm -hmm. was crazy Mm -hmm. did you end up going home during COVID as well I went home um I went home in like the first wave pandemic, whatever, mm-hmm. like March, when everyone was just like super scared. And that's how you met your boyfriend as well, yeah, wasn't it? Yeah, it is. I mean, yeah, COVID romance. Yeah. You guys know. Well, tell us more about that then, because uh, your boyfriend is also Norwe- Norwegian, yeah. but you yeah. both live in London now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we met in COVID. <laughs> <laughs> and I basically, I came home, obviously, from London, like a little bit scared, like, oh my God, COVID, like what's happening? And I fled home to my family in Norway. And I was like quarantining in my room, self-isolating. They were all so scared I had COVID. They had to feed me through the door. Like I would get plates 
like on like paper plates with my food on it and like they would push it through the door and I would just sit there in my room like ah <laughs> I'm so scared <laughs> um and so yeah I was just like active on all my social media like looking out for anyone else who was in the same position as me also quarantining also self-isolating and it turns out that this guy that I went to school with in middle school also came home on the same day on the like at the same exact time with almost the same flight also having to quarantine and sat in his room and self-isolating and he was living like literally like 10 10 minutes away from me and so we started text texting um and I remembered him because I went to school with him but like no intentions like I just wanted to like talk to someone because I was desperate and I was sad and alone in my room and I started talking to him and uh it was actually really nice like we we got along so well and I since I wasn't like I didn't have any intentions behind it. Like I wasn't like this man is going to be my boyfriend or like this is going to be my best friend. I was just being completely honest from the start, texting like he was my friend or like I was just being my true self. And then we ended up bonding really, really well over text. And like after a few days of like texting back and forth, I was like, hmm, I really like this guy. Like he's really funny and really <laughs> cute. And I remembered him from high, from middle school being like this really cute guy that I always like, I was like, yeah, he's cute. But then I just totally forgot about him. And so like two months later, after like texting and voice messaging a lot, and I think even calling <laughs> sometimes, we finally decided to meet because it was like appropriate to meet new people in that time in COVID. And so we met up and had our first dates in real life in COVID. And it was so cute and so nice. And yeah, since then we became a couple, I think a month later or so. And then since then we've been together. He um, also moved to London for his master's because he was about to pursue his master's. So he eventually decided to move to London as well and join me there. And he loved it as well. And that was really great. And so I think two years ago, we decided to move in together after living in London. Like each of us lived in dorms or with friends. And then we moved in together a year later. And now we've been together for four years. It's, it's crazy. crazy, yeah. Time flies. Time flies, yeah. COVID feels like it was yesterday, but also a hundred years ago. It like does. It's, it does. It's kind of weird to think that we lived Another in those world. times where it was like, yeah, not appropriate to like meet new people, yeah, yeah. like or even leave the vicinity of our bedroom, yeah. which seems crazy when you actually think about or it like right have now. Have friends over. Or you know, have friends over or yeah. do any of that kind of stuff. But then it also feels like, yeah, like that wasn't that that long ago for it to be yeah. four years like for someone to have you know started a relationship within that time and for it to be a four-year-old relationship crazy, that was actually yeah. that's you know that's also crazy yeah. as well so no it, it's really cool and it's nice how you guys I guess have both ended up in London as well like yeah. how and how that's worked out um you talk a lot online about um like managing your money you're very mm -hmm. very open about it why do you feel like it's so important to to talk about that transparently as someone like in their early 20s yeah. so I think a lot of well, first of all, in this space where we talk about money online, there's a lot of boys. And mm. I don't love that there's a lot of boys because it becomes a very like masculine area uh, online. So a lot of boys are like very familiar with like, you can invest in index funds and you can grow your money this way and you can do this. But like in the girl world of financial advice and whatever, there's not a lot of information. And so whenever, because I, I am very interested in finance and I studied economics and I, I was always really passionate about this, but whenever I want to look for financial advice, or like like just financial information or like tips and like stuff like savings or like investing. There were only men in the space and it was a very like masculine space as well. Like um, all these like finance bros or like all these like finance guys were like, look at my car, look at all of this. I just, I just didn't like it. And so um, I was very passionate when I started like posting about like more like adult things on my social media to also include this part of me because it was something that I thought was really important something that I care about a lot like I really lately have been really interested in like looking into how I can be the best possible with my money and how I can like in the best possible way save my money invest my money grow my money and just like achieve the things that I want with my money essentially and so yeah I just decided to like if it's a big part of me and a big part of what I care about why don't I just post it online as well and I'm not a financial advisor but I think a lot of people who come from this or like don't know what to do. They don't look for financial advice in the beginning. They just look for someone who can tell them a little bit about the options that are out there. And then you can watch my videos because most of my videos are about lifestyle and are about like life. But then you can come see my videos and you're like, oh wait, so maybe like there's this thing called the Stocks and Shares ISA. So maybe I can open that because I never have heard about it before. Um, and so, yeah. 
that's why I started doing it. Absolutely. I think it's really important to talk about. And obviously, yeah, like you're not a financial advisor and yeah. no way are you giving advice. Yeah. You're just saying, this is what I do. This is what um, exists. Exactly, this exists. Yeah. It's out there and it's possible for people to look into if you want to look into it more. Mm-hmm. Because um, there's a lot of financial advisors and great people to look into if you're interested in financial advice. Obviously, go on YouTube, go wherever. There's mm-hmm. tons of great people that are educated and have the um, qualifications to talk about it. But a lot of people don't even know that that exists out there. They first need to be told the information that, hey, by the way, maybe you should like look into saving in a high yield savings account instead of a regular savings account because you're not getting the return on your money that you should be getting. And then once you have that information, you can go and seek more information and educate yourself more. But someone needs to tell you that information in the first place. And because my videos are more lifestyle, are more life focused, I can be that person and I can tell you, hey, like, this is what I do. And if you want more information, you can go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. But at least that's the possibility that exists and you should educate yourself about some more. Absolutely. And you have like um, a very unique, not a unique way, but like you you have a cool way of tracking your finances, I think, which is well, which (laughs) I'm not sure many young people track their finances as much. I think most people probably get get you know their income straight in their account they pay out whatever that needs to be paid out and they just figure out okay what this is what I've got for the the rest of the month but you really you do track your spending because tracking my finances yeah okay (laughs) tell us how you do it like give us the insight yeah so the reason I do it in such an organized way first of all I'm very organized in all aspects of my life I think it just helps me realize what is there like if I just keep a mess of stuff in my room I don't know what's there and it's the same thing with my money if I just don't track anything. I don't know what I have. And it's also not motivating to like keep going at it. So I have a notion board and I have like Excel templates and I have all this stuff that I have on my computer. But essentially with my notion, I track all kinds of things, including my mortgage savings, my travel or like my vacation holiday savings essentially, and my stocks and shares ISA or like my investments. And so I keep a tracker and I have goals for each one of these things. Like I want to say to go on holiday, so I have X amount of money that I want to save up and that's my goal. I want to say I want to save for a mortgage or I want to save to buy a house. And so I need X amount of money and that is my goal. And then I have the same for investments. And every single month I invest or I put in a little bit of money into each savings account and I track what I spend or I track what I save. And then that goes into my tracker that like puts my little like um, tracker in terms of like how much money I now have saved towards that goal. And it increases a little bit and it goes a little bit to the right. And it's like really fun to look at. (laughs) So, yeah, there's a whole like notion board with like all these little things on my on my computer, on my notion page. And it just makes it more fun to to see your progress essentially. And do you have regular income obviously with what you're doing with content creation? Like do you have a consistent income? Can like, can you plan in advance for your finances? Um, so it's like varied. It's very varied. Some months I, when I go traveling, for example, often I don't have any income because I can't, like it's hard for me to earn money when I'm abroad other than like the YouTube AdSense money that you get paid for like views on YouTube. Mm-hmm. Um, but other months I'm home and I can work all month and it's fine. So it depends, it varies a lot, but I do get paid once a month. So that that's like a little bit yeah, of yeah. A, a little bit of a consistency at least, um, but yeah, it's it, it varies a lot. So it's hard to plan, and that's also why like when I decided to pursue social media full time, I decided that I like I knew I had enough in my savings account to like be fine if I couldn't have or like didn't earn money for like three four months, I would be fine, and that was why it was easier for me to like actually do it full time and pursue it and like dare to do it because I knew I had. A bit savings of a buffer. Yeah, yeah, a bit of a buffer, exactly. And I still have that because um, this, things can happen in your 20s. There's this thing called an emergency fund. And I didn't know about it before last year when I got randomly, or not randomly, but like unexpectedly kicked out of my flat. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> in London. Um, and so me and my boyfriend had to unexpectedly move. We didn't have the savings for it, obviously. And so that was like a big bulk of like basically our whole income that month went to moving, which wasn't really fun. And then we like had to be like really skint <laughs> the rest of the month. The, so the, yeah, there often is times like that, and you're yeah. like, oh, really sensible me should have like yeah. had an mm, emergency nice. fund yeah. for this exactly. For sure. And so after that, we were like, okay, so maybe we should have like a little bit of an emergency fund if a thing like this happens in the future, or any other random or like accidental situation happens and you need some money to like get through the month I think I think it's crazy like how much finances can give you like such a peace of mind like when you know that you've 
you know, there's, I think a holiday is a really great example of this. Yeah. If you've saved up for a holiday, which many people do, and you've saved up and it's 500 pounds, that's whatever it is that you've saved. When you then go on holiday, the freedom that you have knowing that you've got, exactly. I've got this much to spend and it, it's such a nicer feeling than obviously yeah. trying to chase and be like, I don't know if I've got enough money yeah. to do that. The act of saving and then being able to enjoy your money more like relaxed is just such a nice feeling. Is, yeah. And I think it's really hard to do because in these current times, obviously cost of living, everything is getting way more expensive. Yeah. So a lot of people have less disposable income. Have you found that that to be the case? And do you find that it's easier or harder to save? Like I know you've obviously come out of you like two years ago, yeah. but how do you manage saving and living yeah. a fun life, you know? Yeah, so I tried to keep a little bit of a budget and like I, I there's this thing called a 20, 30, 50 budget, I think. And it's not ideal for cities like London where my rent is like literally like 50, 60% of my income, mm -hmm. but it's helpful to have like a little bit of a guide as to where to spend money and where to like not overspend money. And I did this to like, I mean, my boyfriend works in finance, but I literally made him this budget himself because I was like, we both need to get into this and we both need to make sure that we're not overspending in certain areas because it's hard and it's difficult when you have a limited amount of money and you have all these expenditures. And I mean, London's a great city for like spontaneous purchases. And like, there's so much tempting you, like you could go out and buy anything you want essentially. Um, and so it's great to have a budget that you not strictly follow, but at least know you're sticking to. And so, yeah, I, I follow the 20, 30, 50 budget um, as much as I can. And then I also, I did this a little bit before. I've stopped doing it now because I, I know approximately how much I spend each month and I don't vary it that much. But I also, um, I felt like I was overspending a lot in my like first years out to uni because obviously there was a lot of temptation and like I felt like I was like, where is all my money going? Like I didn't know where it was going. And so I started tracking every single thing that I spent and that helped me realize where all this random money was going to and like my subscriptions were like 100, 200 pounds. And I was like, why am I spending all this money on subscriptions that I don't even know I have? So I literally tracked every single thing that I bought. I wrote it down and I calculated how much every single category of my life costs. And I saw where I could cut down. And so I could put that money, take it away from my spending and put it into my saving for the future instead. And that definitely helped a lot because you don't realize how much you spend until you go through every single thing mm -hmm. you've spent on. It's crazy, like cafes and bakeries. And I mean, I'm a bakery lover, but it's not it's not good to spend like a big chunk of your monthly income <laughs> on bakeries either. You know, you can you can relax a little bit with that. Yeah, yeah. I think sometimes it puts in perspective when you like write down, okay, exactly. like this is what I spent on maybe like eating out or, yeah. you know, like buying coffees and yeah. stuff like that. And you look up and then you work out as a percentage of what you've earned that month. Yeah, and you're like, like, oh my God. Okay. That's not great. It's not the best. Yeah. Um, and sometimes it's like little switches as well. Like obviously, um, you know, this isn't going to change, you know, but you being able to buy a house and stuff. Yeah. Like a lot of people say, stop buying coffees and you'll be able to buy a house. It's not that works. That's not, it's not how it works. <laughs> In London. Mm. Yeah, I know. But yeah. there is certain things that, you know, for example, and this is a business expense that we've been paying. Yeah. We've been paying for Notion, the yeah. premium version. Yeah for maybe like two years. And I went on it the other day and I was like, let me just see like what would happen if I were to go to the free version, like, you know, what it would not allow us to do yeah. anymore. We aren't using any of the premium features. Yeah, there you go. And we haven't needed to pay it for two years. And honestly, I felt yeah. like, <laughs> I, like literally like wanting to, yeah, I was just like, it's one of those things. So obviously I moved, I canceled it, I moved it down to the free version, nothing has changed, yeah. but we were paying for that. that it's so annoying, that, for yeah. that. And it's like, and I mean, we're talking like, tw I think it's $24 a month. I don't know what that ends yeah. up like coming back to you, but like, but still, it's still, it's yeah. still money it's that still can money, go to other, yeah. other things. I mean, 24 pounds a month. Yeah. That's like at least, I mean, depends where you go, but like at least one free dinner, probably maybe yeah. even two, yeah. you know, like, going out eating yeah. at a restaurant that's great you know I know so, so yeah. it is just sometimes worth going through like yeah. all your subscriptions and going look could I yeah could I be on the free version could I live without it for yeah. a few months at least exactly. um, and also like I mean this is like just small little tips in regards to saving but there's so many offers constantly and all kinds of things that you can like when I was in uni I ate a lot of stuff for free because mm -hmm. I was on every single restaurant's Instagram every single <laughs> like newsletter you can possibly imagine and I went to all the openings yeah. for free food <laughs> yeah like pokey opening matcha opening coffee opening like i was there pasta they gave out pasta free pasta for a week in soho i was there <laughs> like there's a lot of things you yeah. can do if you really want to go out and like if you want to be food. really savvy exactly as well. exactly yeah. and yeah. like also there's little things that you can do and people are always like why do you do this like 
that's not where you're going to be able to save for a house. But I think if you can save on small things, that's that enables you to spend on other things instead. Like I use a, I connected a 18 to 24, 18 to 25 Oyster uh, to my, no, 18 to 24 rail card, rail card to my Oyster. And that saves me a third off each tube travel, each tube journey. And so every month I save around 16 to 20 pounds on my tube journeys yeah. just from connecting it to my rail card. And yeah, like it's not amazing, but 200, no, 20 pounds a month is like yeah. it ends, like it's two free dinners or one free dinner out. Like that's money I could spend somewhere else instead if I want to. It's just a nice little saving to have. And there's all these kinds of savings all around. Like I upgraded my phone plan to, it cost me like two more pounds to include entertainment. And now I get Netflix for free because mm-hmm. I can't be on my parents' Netflix anymore. I'm really oh, sad. No. <laughs> they kicked me out of it. But yeah. So there's little things like that you can do if you want to like save on certain areas um, and be a little bit savvy. Absolutely. You did mention that, and obviously you mentioned a few times that you are saving to buy an apartment in yeah. London. Yeah. <laughs> and they are not cheap. They are mm. not cheap. Yeah. yeah. What's your plan for that? Because obviously you've outwardly said, it, you've told your audience, yeah. this is what I want to do. Yeah. I want to buy. But it's obviously a huge goal that yeah. takes time to do. Yeah. Like, And it's the most expensive place in the UK to yeah. buy a house. So what is your plan? And yeah. what tips have you got from other people who are telling you, you yeah. should do this if you want to buy a house in London? So the first thing I did was almost like put it out there. Because when you have a goal, it's almost easier to reach that goal, I feel like. When you just like, not tell everyone about it, but like you make it so important in your head that like this is the only thing you're saving up for. This is your goal. This is your long time, long-term goal. And so every month you're consistently thinking about it. So I made it very clear to everyone, including my audience and including to myself. I put it on all my vision boards, on my notion board, online. Like my goal is to buy a house. And every single month I will remind myself of that goal. And so every single month when I get my income, that goal is in there in the back of my mind. I'm thinking about it and I'm immediately saving, putting my money away and saving into my savings account to afford a mortgage in the future. So that's one thing. I also have a lot of structure set up to every single month be able to save or like remember to save. So I have this thing or there's this um, there's this saying that's called pay yourself first. It essentially means that it's easier to save money if you do it the first thing you do in the month, essentially. So when you get your income, if the first thing you do is set aside money for your savings, it's a lot easier to stay consistent with your savings, obviously. So you pay yourself first after your income, essentially. And so that is something I do because it's a lot easier to save that way than saving whatever you have left at the end of the month. Mm -hmm. Um, Another thing I do is, as I said earlier, I keep a tracker on my Notion as to where I am on my progress in buying a house. And my tracker is looking a little bit sad at the moment because it is. (laughs) We're missing a lot of money to be able to afford a mortgage. But it's really nice to be able to every single month when I save, when I put my money into my savings account to put in, you know, X amount put in in July. Done. Check. Next month. X amount put in in August. Check. Mm -hmm. It's like a nice little like I did that for myself this month. I'm really proud of that. And I'm going to keep going. And I see that little tracker that I have. That's like almost like a tracker that like goes from like one point to another. And it's like a green little thing and it moves the more money you pay into it essentially. It's nice to see that slowly but surely move in the right direction. And I know my goal is there. It's far, but at least I'm getting closer to it, essentially. Mm -hmm. And then finally, I also, oh my God, I don't know what that was. (laughs) (laughs) I also also have a mortgage advisor or financial advisor that I've spoken to um, that has helped me kind of realize like what ways we can do this, like saving thing in a smarter way, essentially. So like we've talked about, Or he helped me realize a couple of things like we looked at apartments and we looked at um, areas that I want to live in. And then we looked at financial calculators and we saw, okay, how much mortgage could I afford if I were to put in all my savings now? Okay, how much further do I then have to go? How much longer into the future do I have to wait and save consistently? How much longer do I have to keep doing this for and saving a big proportion of my income to then be able to buy in the future? And how much should I cut down my savings and how much should I, you know, increase my savings essentially so that was quite useful as well 
I think it's important to understand the goal that you're working towards, isn't it? So exactly. like if you sat down with your financial advisor, you're like, okay, I'm happy living in zone six yeah. and I'm happy living in an apartment and I only want one bedroom. That's a different yeah. savings goal too. I want to live in zone one. I want two bedroom house. Yeah. I want to have a garden. Like it's different saving goals. And if you yeah. don't really know what you're saving for, just putting it away, it exactly. doesn't become as clear. Exactly. And then also then if you suddenly realize later down the line, you go, oh, I know that's what I wanted. That's what I thought I was saving for. And you'd only got, the, that yeah. for the you'll end up being disappointed and possibly demotivated at the same time yeah. because you're not actually it's not actually like no that will be the case if I save up that much then exactly I'll be able to get house. exactly yeah. and another important thing to note as well is that like um, in London I think I looked up these stats it's actually crazy like even though I aim to buy in my twenties I think the average age to buy in London is like thirty four or thirty five at this point I think what was it like 60% buy with the parents or help with parents and 70% buy with a partner like it's some crazy stats so like I'm not going to get help from my parents to buy but if I can buy with my partner and maybe be able to buy a little bit earlier Mm -hmm. I will do that as well because I know it'll get me to my goal sooner so I am saving to buy myself but if I can buy with my partner a little bit earlier and we can split the mortgage 50-50 or whatever we end up doing if that can get me to my goal a little bit earlier, that is something that I want to do as well. So mm-hmm. knowing like kind of what options you have and not what unfair advantages you have, but like what you can do to put yourself in a slightly easier situation. If that is moving further out to reach your goal sooner, or moving in with a partner to get to that goal earlier. I met another girl a couple of days ago who was, she actually bought with her sister to mm-hmm. be able to buy earlier. If you can do those kinds of things or like split the mortgage with someone or something like that to make you reach your goal a little bit earlier then why wouldn't you do it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And also like in the UK, we have the lifetime ISAs as well. Yeah. I don't know if you're yeah, able LISA, to, yeah. to, to so get one. So it's in London, it's very hard to use it because yeah. the cap is 450,000 mm-hmm. pounds. And most flats in London, unfortunately, I want to buy a two bed because I do want to like settle in London. I do eventually want kids. And so I think like if I'm, if I am to buy a flat, I probably won't do it this year or next year or a year <laughs> later. But by the time I buy, maybe I'll start thinking about eventually having kids. So I do want to buy a two bed. And for 450,000K, even though that sounds like a lot, in London, it's hard to get a nice two bed Mm -hmm. in like zone one, zone two, zone three even for that price. So. Yeah, yeah, that that is, is the problem with the, the with the lifetime ISA, isn't it? It just yeah. doesn't help people in the city. It doesn't with help. but if you are looking to buy outside of exactly, London, yeah. then and you you know your first property that you're going to purchase is going to be less than four hundred and fifty thousand yeah. pounds, um, and you're not buying with anyone else who has previously owned a house before, because say your partner had previously owned a house, yeah. they wouldn't be you wouldn't be able to to use it that way either. You can you can get. Um, like incentives to obviously purchase house yeah. that, you know you get an extra 25 percent yeah top, top so if up. you save four thousand the government gives you a thousand which is really great yeah it's it a great way really to increase your yeah yeah deposit. but it is interesting because i think i think they need to change it for london for I sure i think so too it's mm-hmm. really sad mm-hmm. it's really unfortunate as well Absolutely. but there are other options as well like if you want to buy in london there are certain schemes like you can buy a new build i think there's like certain things like that you can get like you can do sh- like um the share to buy or something like buy to let there's there's options look into them because i know a couple of the options might not be like shared for everyone yeah exactly yeah yeah it's not for everyone but there are options i have a friend who's actually using that to buy uh, and they looked into it and it was the best you know possible thing for them so there Mm -hmm. are options out there to make it a little bit easier Mm -hmm. because it is tough to buy in london especially nowadays yeah definitely we also chatted like you said you were happy to move into a place that maybe you need to do a little bit of work because you're quite good at DIY projects aren't you I love a little DIY yeah and it actually started with like I mean I always loved like making things myself but when I I mean I'm in my early 20s like I don't have like unlimited budget for anything especially furniture and so when I moved into my first flat and then my second flat a year later I wasn't like out there buying like the most expensive like I saw this I saw this Gusto Vestment table on my Pinterest and it cost like two, three thousand pounds, like ridiculous, right? And I was like, that's not happening. But I went on Gumtree and I was looking for a new table and I saw this table that looked a lot like the table he'd made for like two thousand, three thousand pounds. And it was free. They're giving it away for free. And I was like, hmm, <laughs> what if I get the table, I pick it up, I go get it, I put it into my flat and I paint it. It's essentially the same thing. I can make Gusto Vestment table it, like similar thing for my flat for free if I do all the labor I get the paint I can have that table in my flat that's off my Pinterest board and so I kept doing I, I made the table 
I made it very pretty. I have a green table in my flat now that looks very Gustav Gustav Vestman esque. Um, but I also like I've done several other things. Like I I made artwork for my flat because you know canvas artwork is really expensive. And this is my flat that I rent. I'm not going to live there forever. Why would I invest in a crazy expensive artwork that I don't even know I can bring into my next flat if I can make it myself? And I'm not a great painter, but I looked at this YouTube tutorial and I made myself a little painting, super abstract. I looked at another tutorial, then I made a frame for it, and now I have a framed artwork in my flat that I made both the painting and the frame for. So I keep doing these little things. It's great to save money, um, and it's great to like personalize your flat as well as in a relatively inexpensive way. That's so true because yeah. I, I have um, I am not a good painter, but uh, my best friend is yeah. a very good artist, um, and she's actually a lawyer. Like that's her normal job, but she does like she really enjoys doing art on the side. Yeah, um, and so she's painted two pieces of artwork that are in my house. Actually, one of them is actually two canvases, but they go. They are separate, but they go together. Oh, yeah, I have done two strokes on there, like just to let you know. I, I did nice. partake, but literally, <laughs> it's just like two lines, and I think she probably painted over my lines to be fair because they were very good. <laughs> but people always comment on them yeah. whenever they either come over or like they look really nice when I'm sat on Zoom and they're like, "Your paintings behind you, they're yeah. lovely," and it just makes the whole space feel like you know nice and yeah. and fresh personal. and unique and personal yeah, exactly. as well. So I do think, yeah, like get creative and it's actually yeah. really fun doing those things exactly for sure I mean I painted all my furniture yeah like my because when we bought furniture it was mostly just Ikea I mean Scandinavia represent yeah we love we love <laughs> I- Ikea yeah <laughs> but um I say Ikea that's wrong isn't it Ikea Ikea yeah but that's okay <laughs> but um a lot of the Ikea furniture is obviously very like white yeah very standard everyone has the same thing and so I just started painting it and mm-hmm. like eventually I started doing like craftsy DIYs with it. Like I, I bought three kitchen cabinets, I screw them together and that is our TV unit essentially. Mm. I, we bought a dresser that was like a super basic, like the dresser that everyone has, you know, like the standard big mom or whatever. Yeah. And I put dowels on it, like, and I created like a little square with the dowels on each drawer and I painted it baby blue. And that's like a statement piece in our bedroom now. So I've done little things all around the house. It's like cool how you can personal. like, you can, I've seen loads of videos and I get fascinated watching them on like Instagram and stuff where you see a really cool like thing that they've done and they've bought the the, the basics like you say yeah. from from Ikea. Yeah, exactly. And then they've added on these things and it, all of a sudden it looks like something professional. Yeah, like that, but it's you know, so, easy, so different. Yeah. And actually I'm like, oh, actually I, it's probably easier to do that than I think it is sometimes. It is, yeah. it is. I mean, it takes time. Painting a whole dresser took time mostly just because of the, drying time which is annoying yeah but it's so worth it it's I think so worth it's it. so true like the the sign that you see behind you right now is built from wood that literally like my my mother-in-law and father-in-law they had like a an arbor in their garden which is just like basically yeah. like a piece of like I did not really know what an arbor was but it's, it's like a piece of wood and it goes like that and it's just like it they used to have like a chair underneath yeah and there was a great big storm and the arbor fell over and broke because it had like it's wood and it collapsed and it couldn't be put back together. Mm-hmm. Then I I say like Dan's dad is you know he's such a handyman and I say to him I've got this vision in my head of what I want this new set to look like and I want a kind of slight bit of like nod to like a school chalkboard sort of thing but it's going to have the neon sign on it and it needs to be wheelable from our office to our studio like it needs to look like this and within like 24 hours his dad had had chopped up the arbor that had fallen over in the garden and built this frame what? and I was like okay we're doing yeah. it <laughs> and then I ordered the the wallpaper from behind and we got a board and we screwed it in and we screwed the sign to it it took yeah. probably about 24 hours the pair of us to make this sign mm. but I love it so much more because it's literally personal and exactly. it, it didn't really cost us that much money because well the, you know some of the wallpaper and stuff like that but ultimately if we'd yeah. have paid a professional to do that would have cost thousands. So exactly. yeah, no, you've got to do it yourself sometimes. Yeah. And it makes it all the more special. Like the other day on Tuesday, we were on ITV News um, and we they, they'd they come into the office to film something with one of our guests that had come on the podcast. And it just so happened that they wanted a bit of B-roll and that sign <laughs> is in it now, which is absolutely crazy that it's now 
been on ITV News. So very cool. it's actually crazy <laughs> that you can do so much yourself. I think yeah. some people are sometimes scared to just like give it a go, but like you try can, it. Cause it, yeah. it takes time, but like it, it's not as complicated it's, as you think And it, it feels more special and exactly. you do look at it then. You're like, oh, my friend painted yeah. that or I did that. Or, and it almost yeah. becomes like more valuable too because you spent the hours making it. A hundred percent. Every time I touch my dresser, I'm like, I made that. I'm very <laughs> proud of it. <laughs> you also, the other thing is you, you, in London, obviously, you end up living in quite a lot of small spaces. What yeah. tips do you have for people to like really save space when it comes to living in a house? Because you, you've done tons of videos on how yeah. you save space, right? Yeah, our first flat that me and my boyfriend shared in London, because we couldn't afford a big flat. So we ended up <laughs> we ended up living in a 34 square meter shared flat. So I don't know if you can, like most studios are like 30 something square meters. We had a one bed, so we were lucky. But like the bathroom, you couldn't fit two people in there. Oh you gosh. could max be one person and you could barely turn. It was like, it was <laughs> tiny. tiny. Yeah. The bedroom also, you could only enter the bed from one side. So like, if my boyfriend woke up early, he had to like jump off the bed because he couldn't <laughs> exit because you wouldn't open the door if you put the bed in the middle. Like it was tiny, but it was yeah. great. Like we had tons of fun in that flat. It was a beautiful, beautiful flat. Um, and we made it work because we had a couple of rules. One rule was one in, one out. Mm -hmm. So we could, like, we didn't allow ourselves to buy stuff if we didn't donate something or sell something before that. We had a tiny wardrobe. We shared like a one person wardrobe between two people. And so anytime I bought a new pair of clothes, a new clothing item, basically, I had to remove one clothing, my clothing item from my wardrobe. We also, so that was one rule that we had for everything, like for cleaning products, for um, clothing, for furniture, for decor, one in, one out for everything, essentially. Um, we also did a lot of clever things to like our storage. So this is something that I still follow because even though my, my flat is bigger now, we keep a lot of pieces that are decorative and storage pieces. So for example, we have a bookshelf and bookshelves can end up looking really messy really easily unless you just fill them with books and they look very pretty. We had a bookshelf and it was half storage. So it had a lot of doors on it and then half bookshelf. So we put all our TV stuff, all our cords, all our um, chargers, everything, into the into the um, shelves with doors, hid them away. And then we had our pretty books and our pretty decor like on display in the other shelves. So that was two in one storage and decor mm -hmm. or decor. Um, what else did we have? Oh, we had another clever solution. We put all our extra stuff that we didn't need often in our suitcases. So mm. we packed, because suitcases take up a lot of space, yeah, right? Do, and they yeah. had to be like hidden away in our cupboard. And there in itself, it took up a lot of space. So we hid, I think we hid like duvets, winter jackets. We hid uh, extra pillows. We hid like linens, boots, like all kinds of things in our suitcases. Vacuum packed it and then put it away in the cupboard. Um, we had boxes under the bed that we could slide out and access our workout clothes because we couldn't fit them in the wardrobe. So we had like tons of little things that saved space throughout that was just useful and nice to have. And they, yeah, they made it easier to live in a small space. I think, I think those kind of, you have to kind of be quite clever, clever and yeah. savvy in those situations, don't you? And I think, you know, wherever you can find a bit of storage, yeah. but Use also it. like, it's, it's good to kind of rotate that some people obviously really struggle, like letting go of, of different yeah. things. But I always try and think about it. Like if it's not something I've worn in the past year, exactly. if it's not something I would want to, to, I think I will wear, or if it doesn't suit me or doesn't yeah. fit properly, put that on Vinted or, you know, or donate yeah. to charity or give to a friend. So exactly. yeah, it's... And it's also funny because living small taught me a lot of things. Like it's actually a really good lesson to mm -hmm. learn how to live small because you realize how little you actually need mm -hmm. to like live your life essentially. Like people always think this is weird, but I've, I never travel anywhere with more than a carry-on. Mm -hmm. I don't need more than a carry-on. Yeah, I find that crazy. Like, I I don't, like, I have a big suitcase, but I don't use it. Like, I've done one month trips with the carry-on. I've done one week trips with the carry-on. I've done weekend trips with the carry-on. I go everywhere. One month like, trip with a yeah, carry-on. Yeah. Tell me how you do that, please. Well, packing cubes <laughs> and, like, organization. And, like, just pack smart. Like, think of what you wear in a month normally. You don't really vary your outfits that much. I mean, I don't. I use a lot of the same things. I don't use that many different things I mean for winter it's definitely more difficult because you have bigger clothing items but I went to I went to Mexico I went to Costa Rica for a month in total only with a carry-on it's great it worked out perfectly I didn't even use all my clothes that I brought in the carry-on what yeah the only crazy. issue is the toiletries but mm. you can buy stuff there that's what I always think like you can buy a shampoo and conditioner I go through one a month anyway because I yeah. use so much in my big hair so yeah <laughs> it's so smart so smart 
If you're watching the Talk 20s podcast on YouTube, you'll always see that we have these drinks out on the table. They're Riviera iced tea. And I was honestly so excited when they reached out to sponsor the podcast because I am obsessed, like seriously obsessed with iced tea. If I'm getting a meal deal, I'm getting an iced tea. If I'm on holiday and I don't fancy something alcoholic, I'm ordering an iced tea. And now here in the studio, we have iced tea on tap always and our guests love it. Riviera iced tea is also low calorie, natural natural, vegan, and gluten-free, what a bonus. And the peach iced tea from them is genuinely the best I've ever tasted. You can only get these drinks online right now. So run, don't walk over to rivieraicetea.com and fill your fridge with something super refreshing this summer. So I'm guessing that you probably have like a capsule wardrobe then like, because if you're only packing outfits for a month, like, you know, yeah. most people will think that's not possible. But it is. <laughs> so yeah, there's a, there's a system that I use. I have a whole YouTube video on it that like, has like over half a million views now because people think it's crazy that I only use a carry-on, but I promise it's not. So uh, in general, I pack for, I try to pack for like a week because if you think of a month, often you just end up wearing the same clothes that you wear in a week over and over again, at least I do. So normally when I went on this one month trip with a carry-on, I packed, I think I packed seven t-shirts and tanks and then like two jumpers for the whole trip. And then I packed um, one pair of trousers or bottoms per every two to three days. And then I packed some workout clothes and I packed some nice dresses. I think I packed two dresses a week, essentially some nice going out clothes or like some nicer tops if I want to go out, like those kinds of things. And then you just wash it. You wash it every week or so. Like you can, you can wear a tank and a jean for a lot of days, you just switch out the tank, you wear the jean over and over again, you switch out your underwear, whatever. But yeah, you just, you don't wear that many different things. At least I don't. And I learned that when I lived small and I learned that when I traveled as well. Like you just end up wearing the same things over and over again. You can wash them. But yeah, capsule wardrobe. Mm. It's very clever. And packing cubes as well, you mentioned. Yeah, packing cubes. Packing cubes help a lot because they can compress your items mm -hmm. and they can help you stay organized. So I have a packing cube. Normally what I do is that I have a packing cube for my tanks. I have a packing cube for my... Um, my trousers and my shorts and my like bottoms essentially. I have a packing cube for swim. I have a packing cube for swimwear and underwear, so I keep that separate. I have one for dresses and like shirts and um, maybe like some like cardigans like this, and I keep all those together. And that is it makes it so easy for me that when I'm looking in my luggage, I'm like, okay, today we need one tank, one bottom, and one top to go over it. That's it. Boop out. You know. Um, and then I put that in the wash or I put some things back and then I, the next day I do the same thing. One tank, one bottom, one garment to put on top. Okay, got it, next. <laughs> I I'm, I don't think I'll ever pack the same way again after yeah. <laughs> this conversation. I think I'm gonna now challenge myself yeah. to go away with just a carry-on. You don't need anything yeah. more, I promise. And often like, I I sometimes when I bring a bigger luggage, I'm like, well, I don't like, I'm, I end up using, not using half the things. Like, mm -hmm. why did I bring this? It's, it feels stupid. You know, I brought all these things and I don't even use them. It's Find very the smart. This episode yeah. has just been filled with like gems of like how to save money and how to basically live smarter. So nice. I love it. <laughs> um, but we always ask our guests a few questions about their twenties. Um, yeah. And I think they're really kind of a good way of showing like, not everyone is perfect. We're all working through our own kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, is there something that you're trying to work through right now? Because a lot of people will sit here and go, oh, Maddie, she's got it all figured out. She's living in London. She's living her best life. For you, is there something that you feel like, oh no, like guys, I still seriously haven't yeah. got it still figured out. I'm trying to work on this, yeah. for example. So I, I think I've shared some of this previously, but I struggled a lot with anxiety last year. Mm -hmm. uh, it started when I got kicked out of my flat. And actually I think it started in uni, but I kind of just like pushed it down and hid it away. And then it got a lot worse when I got kicked out of my flat. Um, maybe I should I should just explain that. But essentially, our landlord sold our flat or like wanted it back, and we had like a month warning, and then we had to leave, and we didn't expect it, so we had to move very quickly. Um, but yeah, after that situation, that came very unexpectedly, and I got a lot of um, I got a lot of views, and I got a lot of hate comments about it, and it just put me in a very vulnerable position where I think. I wasn't feeling great from before of in terms of my anxiety, but that just kind of triggered it. Why did you get hate comments? Um, well, anytime you post a video that performs well, you get hate comments, yeah, True, I think. Yeah. So yeah. that's why that's what triggered a lot of the hate comments. But yeah, I think after after all those comments and after my views, after all those comments and after my views um, increased a lot, 
I think I just became really like scared of like potential like implications like getting kicked out again like um potential things that like probably wouldn't happen but maybe they would and I got scared of that and I got scared of like posting certain things and then I got scared of saying certain things and then it just kind of like snowballed into like a lot of anxiety in everyday situations where like a certain little thing would trigger like a big anxiety attack or like Mm -hmm. a certain thing that I said um to a friend would then suddenly trigger me to have a lot of anxiety like oh my god how did you interpret that like uh I got yeah I got anxiety really easily and it wasn't like that before um but I think it had built up for quite some time and me getting kicked out kind of triggered it and then it just became worse and worse and worse and I first I thought like oh this is something I can work through myself like whatever but I definitely couldn't and it was nice to have like my boyfriend support me through it but I eventually realized that like I'm this is only getting worse like I need to talk to someone professional about this or it's not gonna end well and I'm gonna just keep struggling and like not gonna get through it essentially and so I've never spoken to a therapist ever before that but I just realized that like either I speak to a therapist or I can't keep doing my job mm-hmm. and I can't keep having these relationships with my friends because I literally cannot have a normal conversation throughout a week and like be fine. Like mm-hmm. every single week I was getting an anxiety attack or like something would trigger my anxiety and I would feel so unwell. I couldn't keep going on in my day. I couldn't have normal thoughts anymore. So it was quite awful, not very fun. Um, and anyone who hasn't gone through anxiety before, I before... I had it myself I was always like oh but it's probably not that big of a deal like you know whatever like you can get through it whatever but when you have anxiety when you get anxiety attacks it's awful you can't get yourself out of it it's like a spiraling loop and you just get deeper and deeper and deeper into it and it's just very like it's not fun and small things can trigger and suddenly you're in that like snowball effect again so Mm -hmm. it was very helpful to to go speak to someone about it and it took me a little bit of like convincing myself that you know it's fine to get help mm-hmm. when you need when you need it it's fine to speak to someone and seeing a therapist regularly is the best decision that I possibly could have done for myself and I'm so happy I did it but it did definitely take a little bit of convincing because I was like no I don't need it like it's okay I'm fine I'm fine I don't need help doing this I can do it alone but sometimes you do need help going through things and and seeing her has been really really helpful mm-hmm. for getting through it and it's crazy, but I look back at myself a year ago and I'm like, I'm such a different person now than I was then. Like I can I can put on a lot of work now and I can get through it versus a year ago, it would have completely broken me and I wouldn't be able to get through my week versus now I can take on work and I'm not stressed about it. And I know I can get through it. But yeah, it's crazy how much, how much <laughs> things can change. But yeah. It yeah. seems, it, you seem quite choked up talking about anxiety. Yeah, because it's a big, it's like, It's a big, scary thing, Mm -hmm. I think. And as I said, like a lot of people who hasn't, who haven't had anxiety don't get it. And I, and I get that a hundred percent because I know how I felt about anxiety before I had it myself. But when you have it, it's so scary and it's so like spiraling almost like you start with your thoughts and then it gets worse and you start spiraling your thoughts even more. And then eventually you're just like, you feel like a wreck of yourself, which is awful, even though it was the tiniest little situation that triggered it. And so it's really awful and I don't, yeah, I don't wish anxiety upon mm-hmm. anyone. It's an awful feeling and yeah, I'm happy that I've gotten better now. But anxiety is scary and I totally relate with anyone that feels that kind of way. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of people will will really appreciate you being, yeah. like sharing that as well because I think, you know, I've been through it a yeah. lot in my early 20s as well and exactly what you're feeling right now is like, yeah, that's yeah. exactly what it used to feel yeah. like for me. And things have got better also. Exactly. So I think you just have to hope. It's that almost there's... crazy to look back. Yeah. And like, cause I thought I was in an okay situation, but I look back now and I'm like, like, wow, I can get through so much more and I can like, like things have changed so much for the better. I didn't know how bad things were yeah. with my anxiety until now that I'm feeling a lot better about it but it's yeah I'm really happy that things got better and things can get better for anyone who is struggling with it now I know that myself because I've gone through it but yeah anxiety is the worst 
Mm-hmm. It's not fun. Well, thank you for sharing that so candidly as well. Um, it has been incredible to have you on the podcast. We've covered so many different topics, but I just think that you are, you know, for many people, I'm sure they're watching your video and feeling very inspired by you, your honesty, your ability to for people to, to relate with you. There's just, you're just so, so, so great on the internet. And uh, yeah, just continue to do what you're, do, what you're doing because um, we all love watching it. But we always ask, ask our guests the same question to end the podcast. And it's if you could look back at 20 year old Maddie, so you're 23 yeah. now, if you could look back at Maddie three years ago yeah. and be come to her in like ghost form <laughs> and you could just give her like one piece of advice that would see her through her 20s, what would you want to say to her if you like looked her in the eye? Don't stress. Don't stress about it. Mm-hmm. I think I, I went into my 20s with a lot of like, I want to do this, I want to go there, I want to do that, I want to achieve all these things and I don't know how to get there and I don't see this like, like I, I, I don't know where to go. Like, I don't have this massive plan, but I just know I want to achieve all these things. Things fall into place. It's crazy what they do. Mm-hmm. And I never expected myself to end up doing social media full time, but now I do and I love it. And I never would have imagined this to be such a great role and job for me and to fall into place the way it has, but it has. And I think a lot of people have the same thing. Like you go out of uni or you enter your twenties and you're like, I don't know where I'm going to go. Like, this is also confusing, but it falls into place. Like, you start a job, you realize, maybe that job wasn't for me, I'm going to try something else. You start a job, maybe you realize, ah, this was nice, but maybe I want to go that direction instead. Mm -hmm. You know, like, everything, you just kind of have to, like, put yourself into things and things will fall into place from there. And if you do something and you realize that wasn't for me, that's another lesson learned. And that will take you further into you realizing what is actually right for you and what the path is for you because your whole life is ahead of you and it gets really, really confusing. Once you just actually, you're in it and you're making decisions, you're on your way to get to your goal or get to your destiny or wherever you want to do essentially. So things will fall into place. Don't stress about it. Just kind of like stay in there and yeah, do things that make you happy essentially. I love that. Thank you so much, Manny. It's been amazing <laughs> to have you on the podcast. Thank you so much for coming Thank you up for from having London. Me. It's been amazing to have you here. Well, nice. Amazing. <laughs>